So um, my name is Maya Indira Ganesh. I'm a senior researcher at the Leverholm Center for the Future of Intelligence. And uh, I'm also co-director of the MST in AI Ethics and Society at the Institute for Continuing Education. I will be um, talking about my work on the MST as well. And I'm here today as part of the Leverholm Center. So this talk is called The Beginning of Theory, and it is uh, provoked and prompted by a pretty historic op-ed from 2008 that you might have read. It's called The End of Theory. I'm going to start with that and draw out some lessons for the predictions made in the end of theory for um, the data-driven human social world that we live in. I'm going to draw some reflections uh, from some examples and then talk about how that relates to the establishment of this field called AI ethics, which is you know, the, the course that I run um, with my colleague, Johnny Penn, and then leave you with a sort of something to think about in terms of uh, very real life situations involving machine learning applications in a sector that's really close to all of us, I think, um, and that's education. So let's start with Chris Anderson's historic pro proclamation from 2008, which has now come true. He was declaring the um, inaugurating, launching uh, big data, as it were. And he wrote in Wired magazine that he was the chief editor of at the time. Uh, you know, Wired magazine has always been a kind of tech booster, tech optimist kind of magazine. So it kind of made sense that he would write about uh, this new data-driven world that was coming. And he says, this is a world in which massive amounts of data and applied mathematics replace every other tool that might be brought to bear. Out with every theory of human behavior from linguistics to sociology, forget taxonomy, ontology, and psychology. Who knows why people do what they do? The point is they do it, and we can track and measure it with unprecedented fidelity. With enough data, the numbers speak for themselves. Now, there's, there's a lot to unpack here and in the whole op-ed. I mean, he goes on to also say a lot of other things. Um, my, one of my favorites is that, you know, in which he compares all languages and, and sort of says that they're kind of the same because they're all data points. So he says that, you know, Farsi is like Klingon because all it matters is that, you know, you can have one kind of um, data-driven system to translate languages and uh, there isn't, you know, he was kind of erasing culture in some respects, uh, not realizing that he was actually uh, talking about a whole new kind of culture of datafication. I think it's also kind of funny that he, maybe makes a taxonomic error here in sort of putting taxonomy, ontology, and psychology together because they're not the same kind of thing. Similarly, linguistics and sociology, there's just this kind of broad sweep uh, of all of these different things that are not actually the same thing uh, or even similar in any way. So I want to start with this um, to kind of cast some doubt on Anderson's prediction because we are living on the other end of this data-driven future in which you know, quantification and data-driven systems have been applied to the human social world. And as much as, you know, these technologies might be absolutely uh, wonderful in shaping uh, many of the sciences, um, human society and behavior uh, and relationships are a different kind of uh, system altogether. And I think that machine learning applied to the human social world has generated some egreg egregious harms chiefly because machine learning was kind of working ex exactly as expected. Now, as I've said, they could be useful and valuable in a lot of scientific fields, but, um, but what we see now is that we have so many databases just recording incidents of harm coming from machine learning and data-driven systems. And I wanna look at some of them now to kind of draw out some lessons from them. So let's start with one of the more recent ones, which um, is the Dutch uh, benefit scandal. So since 2019, the Dutch government has been embroil embroiled in a scandal after the country's tax authorities used a self-learning algorithm to create risk profiles in an effort to spot fraud among people applying for childcare benefits. Authorities penalized families over a mere suspicion of fraud based on the system's risk indicators. Tens of thousands of families were pushed to poverty because of exorbitant debts to the tax agencies. Some committed suicide. More than a thousand children were taken into foster care due to the scandal. 
Now, the risk, the, the criteria for the risk profile was developed by the tax authority. And, you know, in some of the variables that they picked in determining um, what this, this tool would look like, they included things like having dual nationalities um, as well as low income. And what that ended up doing was that started targeting people who were uh, minorities in the Netherlands, many of them ethnic minorities and from uh, from poorer countries in the global south who had emigrated, some asylum seekers. Um, the authorities then started claiming back benefits from families who were flagged by the system without proof that they had committed such fraud. Another incident that might be uh, quite familiar to people in the UK, which was about the A-level algorithms, Given the conditions of the uh, pandemic that made it impossible for high school students to do their school leaving exams, the National Education Authority and regulator Ofqual developed a standardized standardization algorithm to ascertain marks. There was significant public outcry as the algorithm had the disparate effect of downgrading the results of those who attended state schools and upgrading the results of pupils at privately funded independent schools, thus in disadvantaging students of a lower socioeconomic background. In part due to the algorithm's behavior around a small cohort, uh, around small cohort sizes, and um, so we saw these kind of disparities that were um, predicted just based on people's, um, you know, postcode. And of course, those in the UK will remember that we had actual protests. It was a pandemic, but you had people coming out on the streets and protesting the results. Then we had uh, the case in Australia of the robocalls, very similar to the Dutch uh, case. There was an automated government scheme which incorrectly demanded welfare recipients pay back benefits. People received letters saying they owed thousands of dollars in debt based off of an, an incorrect algorithm. More than half a million Australians were affected when the scheme aimed to replace the formerly manual system of calculating overpayments and issuing debt notices to welfare recipients um, and this was just kind of a badly made algorithm, but it was happening on the scale of like the tax office. Um, deeply unfortunate. Um, and moving to a slightly different set of cases now that are not about kind of like welfare and benefits, but more sort of related to um, uh, demographics and personal characteristics. So a really important case is the Gender Shades project. Um, and I would say that this is a historic project that kind of set off the field of AI ethics and algorithmic bias in many ways and gave it shape. So at uh, the time of Gender Shades, uh, Dr. Joy Bulamini was doing her PhD then. Uh, she found that a facial recognition sensor was not reading her face uh, whereas it could read the faces of her white colleagues. And when she wore a white mask, uh, it perceived her face. And this was kind of the starting point for her work. Uh, in fact, in this very week, um, Dr. Bolomini is on a book tour in the United States for her new book, Unmasking AI, in which she tells the story uh, of this. And the Gender Shades project itself was done with uh, Dr. Timnit Gebru, her collaborator, and they tested the facial recognition systems of three companies, IBM, uh, MegB, the system Face++, Plus Plus, and which is a Chinese company, and Microsoft. What she and her collaborator, Dr. Gebu, found was that these three systems recognized more white and more male phenotypes uh, more efficiently as compared to female and darker ones. Now, the, their intention was not to actually get these systems to become better at recognizing you know, uh, darker or more uh, female uh, faces. These are already very highly surveilled communities in the United States and in Europe, um, but more to kind of draw attention to how are these systems being architected? What is the database that goes into them? Who is developing them and for what? And what does it mean to actually subject humans to facial recognition systems? And we've seen it's not just about you know, sort of predicting crime or anything like that. We're seeing these systems being used to read emotions. This is a highly contested and problematic area of, it is a pseudoscience. Uh, it's been used to uh, predict criminality in people's faces to identify homosexuality. Uh, we have to be extremely careful about, um, you know, using uh, data science uh, so readily in social science without uh, the sort of necessary safeguards, especially when these areas are so complex and are sites of quite extensive study already. So that was the Gender Shades project. And then another very historic and really important case, I think, that sort of 
um, brings a lot of uh, issues in AI ethics and machine learning ethics together is the one of North Point, a company that developed a tool called Compass to identify, uh, predict recidivism, so the risk of reoffending. And they found in the United States where they developed and applied this uh, that the tool disproportionately identified black and brown people as being more likely to reoffend, uh, and the tool was found to be faulty and uh, found to not actually represent the the reality of uh, reoffending. Now, what these uh, and then the final case I'll talk about that you know many people don't know about it because it's it's quite early on. It's from you know a decade ago, and it's I think it's a really powerful example and one that has a lot of resonance for us. I think uh, in the academy because it involves an academic, a very highly um, you know decorated, uh, illustrious academic, uh, not you know just a member of the general public, but an expert in this field. Uh, Professor Latanya Sweeney was the first Black woman to get a PhD in computer science from MIT in 2001. She did her undergraduate work at Harvard. She has multiple patents. She has served as the CTO, the Chief Technology Officer for the Federal Trade Commission of the United States, um, extremely widely published and illustrious. And she wrote in 2013 about Black identifying names, and, and hers is actually one of them. And what she found was that the delivery of ads by Google's AdSense uh, was using, you know, was making a correlation between racially associated names and finding that uh, quite significantly ads to people with such quote unquote black sounding names were being given ads related to incarceration. So this was about lawyers, this was about bail bonds. Um, and much more than people with names like Jeffrey, Jill, and Emma, uh, people with names like Deshaun, like her own name, were getting uh, ads related to, to, to incarceration because the assumption was that people with Black identifying first names were more, more likely to be engaged in or have, um, uh, you know, people uh, who are incarcerated or in uh, engaged in, in criminal activity. And I think that these cases are, you, you know, there are, there, I mentioned there are incident databases and harms registers, which talk about a number of cases. These are the really well, uh, well known ones and highly um, uh, very popular ones because they've been written about and talked about a lot and academics have used them a lot in, we've used them a lot in our research and writing. Uh, but I invite you to look at the incident registers and databases. There's, there's many, many cases like this. Now, what can we learn and identify from some of these cases? The first is that machine learning is a vast pattern making, pattern finding apparatus. It relies on correlative approaches through data that must first be selected, cleaned, and made suitable for use. Things like homogeneity, uniformity, and scale really matter in these systems, but the reality is that the data of and about and from the human social world is often not such. And it comes often from free sources like the internet, and crucially, um, this data sort of contains all the biases and imprints of the world. Um, so it's going to go into automated systems then and architect automated systems, um, carrying a lot of those traces uh, of bias and discrimination of an already unequaled hierarchical uh, racist and misogynist world and have them be re replicated through machine learning systems. And the problem is that uh, once those decisions are out there in the world, it's really hard for individuals affected by them to hold them to account. You don't understand how it's happened. Can you imagine kind of getting a call or a notice saying that uh, you have uh, defrauded the government or you're being investigated for this uh, when you haven't? It is terrifying. And especially if you are somebody who is already marginal in society, if you are on a visa, if you are in poverty, then these things are even more terrifying because you know that nobody has your back in these cases. The other is that you know machine learning is constituted by algorithms that the historian of science, Professor Lorraine Dastin, refers to as thin rules. In her History of Rules, the book is Rules, A Short History of What We Live By, Dastin identifies algorithms as thin rules that are not intended for, quote, a predictable, stable world in which all possibilities can be foreseen. 
She writes, algorithms do not, quote, invite the exercise of discretion. They are an instance of operations divided and subdivided into steps so small and unambiguous that even a machine could ex execute them. Thick rules, on the other hand, are more like models that are upholsters with upholstered with examples, caveats, observations, and exceptions. Now, what happens when we have these thin rules with highly biased and problematic data already coming into addressing social science issues and problems? We have to ask if you know, predicting recidivism, if reoffending, if fraud, the pandemic, are these really data science problems and or are they social problems? And if they are one and not the other, then what is the role really of data in them? And, you know, if we need to fix those systems, is data the answer? Uh, and if data is the answer, then who are the experts who really understand those fields uh, who are who have oversight over these systems? I mean, there's... Um, one of the challenges with data science and machine learning technologies is that, you know, we sometimes might think of them as operating systems. They can just be applied to a wide range of fields and domains, and that's not true. Uh, while there might be data, you know, we live in a datafied world, as Chris Anderson predicted, uh, we do. Not all those kinds of data are necessarily the same, and those da and data is also social. Um, data is also kind of like part of the world. The other thing is that um, a lot of machine learning systems of the kind that I've talked about, but also many others in social media. I haven't really talked about social media examples or, you know, uh, because that's a whole other set of concerns, I think. Um, but many of them are made by companies that have uh, quite inordinate levels of influence and power and wealth already in the world. And they are in they have relationships with governments and public institutions. And we have to take very seriously the fact that there is no oversight that we have yet fully over these systems and their uh, corporate owners. And though I think, you know, the regulators are trying very hard to bring more transparency and accountability to these systems. But I think it's sort of something really important for us to, to reckon with in uh, thinking about machine learning applications in the wider social world. Now, I want to move to, you know, all these incidents and cases that have been occurring have uh, really generated uh, fresh new thinking uh, across a number of fields from law to the social sciences and humanities about how to interrogate these systems and how to hold them to account um, in, in our work within the academy, but also in, in regulation and in governance. So in a little over the past half decade, applications of machine learning have proliferated in domains such as finance and banking, social welfare, cultural curation, education, health, criminal justice, and retail. And so have concerns of bias, discrimination, and unfairness. So AI ethics, ethical AI, and FATE, F-A-T-E, fa fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics, these are academic and industrial responses to mitigate and prevent the negative outcomes of machine learning. As a result, we have scholarship and practice in law, computer science, business and regulatory policy, and software product design that have become sites for values-driven approach to machine learning. But how they contribute to shaping, reshaping technology is far from widely agreed upon. Carly Kind says that the term ethical AI has finally come to mean something. She talks about how, you know, the, so the first wave of AI ethics, according to Kind, is, you know, high level principles. You had everybody from, you know, industrial bodies to academic institutions to all kinds of other governance institutions talking about, you know, principles, and you've seen many of these sets of principles of human rights and transparency and accountability. That was the first wave. The second wave, you know, focused more on like these examples of bias and discrimination that I talked about. Uh, the second wave identified within these incidents, you know, how bias and discrimination were computational, uh, the sort of computational basis of these uh, applications and tried to find uh, solutions that were also computational. But both these waves actually neglected questions related to systemic injustice and the control of infrastructures. Now, the third wave is 
you know, and Kind was writing this in 2020, uh, was raising kind of more systemic, political, infrastructural, and social concerns associated with the technologies. And Kind was writing this in the months following global condemnation of George Floyd's killing by the police, as students in the UK were protesting the algorithmic determination of their A-level grades. And at the time when the Dutch courts ordered a complete halt on the use of uh, algorithmic fraud detection tools that unfairly targeted immigrants. Now, what kind is suggesting, you know, through these waves, and you know, when you say first, second, third, you kind of think that one sort of follows the others, but in fact, they're all kind of happening at very much the same time. And these different kind of multiple continuous waves um, are not all kind of originating and terminating in the same place. Uh, I prefer to actually think of them as tributaries instead. And, you know, I think that what runs through them is that, you know, discussions of power, inequity, and justice enabled uh, in response to society harm are what we need to actually be talking about. And so we have certain upstream concerns around, let's say, human rights and anti-discrimination law. We have another upstream location, which might be philosophical inquiry and traditions from philosophy and thinking about the ethics of these systems. And there's also very real sort of location uh, and, you know, for thinking about these uh, approaches to, to ethics that are infrastructural, that are planetary, that are very kind of like hard material limits to these technologies. Um, there's also a lot of work around civil society organizing uh, and movements that around uh, discrimination in society. So I think that these are all different locations from which we have different tributaries of engagement with machine learning and data-driven systems as sites for, for harm. And that sort of um, prompted uh, the Leverholm Center for the Future of Intelligence, where I work, to launch the MST in AI, Ethics, and Society. I'm one of the two course directors, and along with my colleagues, Henry Shevlin and Johnny Penn, um, we, we put this program together over the last, over the last two, two, almost three years now. And uh, we're in our, we've just welcomed our third cohort, I believe what's interesting about this course, what's unique about it is that this is um, a course that is tailored to working professionals. We know that there are many courses about, you know, teaching ethics to computer science students or in STEM fields. And we're not kind of working in this sort of downstream location where it's imagined that, you know, if people have this in their education early on, this will influence the rest of their careers. And it, it will, no doubt. Uh, nor are we looking at sort of you know, um, influence to the highest levels of big tech companies. Um, so, you know, our site is not Silicon Valley, though many of our students might be from there. I think what we're really interested in working professionals who are lay experts in their own fields from across, you know, a number of different sectors, uh, coming back to university while working and often with a lot of oversight and you know decision making and authority in context where algorithmic technologies are being applied so our students do work in government in the military in banking and finance in tax in education and healthcare they are people who are making the decisions that will lead to the adoption of ai and algorithmic and data driven machine learning technologies and that's what's actually really exciting i think and unique about our course uh, that it's um, in this continuing education context with practitioners. And this means that, you know, we, the, the other interesting thing is that, you know, while we have people coming from backgrounds in law and policy and regulation, the focus of the course is really sort of anchored in humanities and social scientific approaches from, you know, the different um, fields that you see uh, on the slide. And what we're trying to do is to bring some of these social and political concerns to the work of developing and deploying machine learning technologies in the world and trying to find a way that uh, critique and thinking and scholarship from these different fields might actually come to bear on the design and rollout of machine learning technologies. And I think what's, what is most critical is that it's actually our students who are going to do it through their dissertations, through their everyday practice. We're seeing how they're actively translating between work that we're doing in the classroom to talk about and surface these concerns, and then they're taking it to their workplaces. And I think this is um, what is really inspiring about this work. And the challenge for us is to, to make all of these different fields 
uh, legible because uh, to to lay experts and working professionals because as you know you know as experts we're all kind of in our own uh, bubbles talking to other experts and kind of doing the work of translation is is absolutely necessary I think uh, in this area and sort of building building connections and it's not just about literacy it's about I think empowering people to feel like um, they can they can arrive at their own imaginations and solutions for the applications or related to the application of machine learning technologies in their sectors. And uh, coming to a close now, I want to leave you with a story that kind of relates to this a little bit. Um, and it comes from not too far away. This is in the context of, you know, the past week or 10 days, those of you in the UK will know we've had the big AI safety summit, which was, you know, the, the government uh, inviting uh, people from industry and, and other countries to talk about risks associated with AI and safety concerns associated with um, large language models. And I was part of something called the Hopes and Fears Lab, AI edition, which was run by the university's Kavli Center for Science, Ethics, and the Public. And this is a wonderful research center that does a lot of public engagement work around science and technology issues, you know, a number of different technology issues uh, and science issues. And this one was about AI. So they had these two fantastic bright red double-decker buses uh, on Parker's Peace in the center of Cambridge. And it was for members of the public to just walk in and talk about AI. And um, I was one of the, the experts who was on the bus for one day. And I had a conversation with a woman who will, I will call uh, Mila. That's not her real name, uh, but I don't want to use her real name. So Mila is a teacher's assistant. Um, she works with a psychotherapist in primary schools in the Cambridgeshire County. She was on her way to work and walking through Parker's Peace. And she saw the bus and she she got on the bus and... Um, the one really interesting thing that the Kavli Center did, and I think that they do with their labs, is when people come onto the bus, they get to choose a sticker, a badge that they can wear. And the stickers come in three colors, uh, a red one for if you're positive and hopeful and excited for AI, a dark blue one if you're uncertain and not hopeful about AI, and a black one if you are undecided and in the middle. So Manuela Amila uh, was wearing... Um, a dark blue sticker, which suggested that she was um, uncertain and not hopeful about AI, and I was too, and maybe that's why we were matched. And she spoke for about 20 minutes, and I don't think she really wanted to know much about AI, but she wanted to express her concerns about AI, because this was a woman who has been teaching for about 15 years and has seen the introduction of digitization and digital technologies into the school system in education technology. And uh, for her, AI was one more digital technology that was disrupting and changing education and changing children's learning without an understanding of how it's being changed and with a lot of risks uh, and harms that she knew, she knew that she was going to have to absorb. So she was saying that, for instance, you know, it's well understood and recognized amongst educationists that learning is social, that it is not as simple as just sitting in front of a monitor or an iPad and swiping through and having an individualized tutor bot. The learning has to be done with a teacher, with other students, and that is the best way children learn. And, you know, pandemic, the pandemic was a good, a, a very, very strong sort of empirical moment in showing that that's true, that when children are separated from each other, when you don't have the right classroom environment, uh, it is really hard for children to to learn and you can have, you know, the best tutor bots, uh, but there's a lot of work for educationists and teachers and there's a lot of work for parents and, and children to to work. And I would say children, but also, you know, children at the university level, people coming to, to university and studying in the university as well. I think this has been very challenging for them. So Mila's concern was that whatever AI and machine learning might be and whatever its potential is, it's coming into a world that has already been shaped quite significantly by data and you know, machine learning technologies. And it's building on and drawing on the social, political, and economic infrastructures that exist. It's not something which is just going to be in a lab. It is in the human social world. And as far as that is the case, then I think we need to 
continue to be sensitive to those social contexts and kind of draw on those people who understand those contexts and bring them to the tables where, you know, experts sit and make decisions about these things. And um, I'm happy to say that I think that the while the government and, you know, people in power and experts were talking about AI safety, you had a number of different uh, events related to the AI fringe, so-called um, that involved civil society and involved members of the public, involved trade unions and schools um, to really move beyond this idea of just literacy and to, and to ask what it might mean for um, everyday people. If our lives are going to be transformed by AI and ML, then uh, can we also be actors in driving that change? Um, thank you very much for listening. Any questions for our speaker? Hi, can you hear me? So, uh, yes, I can hear you. So, so machine learning is nothing new than statistical model building that we've done for decades. So in what sense should we have an urgency? I mean, this is something which has been discussed over decades and has been part in policy. It has been part of the discussion. For me personally, it's a lot of the question of using the tools in the right way, having an understanding of how they're working. You seem to go into a different direction here because you don't seem to teach even in this course the statistics of what is underlying these models. So the often the wrong kind of usage of these of these tools is not even looked at at this course. So why do you think coming from from this perspective actually does help to this situation that we're facing? Uh, thanks so much for your question, and um, yeah, I'm I'm happy for this opportunity to talk about our work. Um, I should just say that uh, I'm in an area where there might be some disturbance and noise. I'm actually quite close to a um, a railway line, so you might hear trains in the background. Um, so to your question, um, I think there are quite a few courses which just focus on the technical aspects of machine learning and very few of them that relate to, what's the train? Um, very few of them that relate to uh, this kind of concerns that I've raised. And I think what we're saying in that is that the kinds of people who come to our course are the ones who should be taking that perspective to their own fields. And where so the, and there are two things happening in that. One is that we actually have people who sometimes are themselves professors in the first um, cohort, we had a bioethics professor from Australia, we had a management professor from Scotland, um, and we had a law professor from the US. In the current cohort, we have a pure mathematician um, at, between, who's between Cambridge and, and Oxford. So we, on the one hand, we do seem to attract people who are already experts in education in different fields and they're coming to the course um, and so we're hoping and seeing that you know there will be some kind of productive translation there um, the other is that I think it's I think that there might be ways for us to bring these ideas more to, to a wider audience that may not themselves be architecting the model, but the, the model architecture is one thing it's about its use then in different places. I think that's the argument that I was I was trying to make. And I think, I mean, eventually in, a, in an ideal scenario, uh, we should actually be integrated into courses on uh, machine learning and data science. And this is something I've been trying to start doing with within the university through collaborations with people in other departments. So far, it's only with uh, some folks in engineering, uh, but I'm trying to think about in my own research, what does a community of practice uh, involving experts who work across these fields, what does it mean for us to actually work together rather than just, um, uh, you know, in sort of siloed ways? So uh, it's still very early days yet with some of this. So I hope that's a suitable response to your question. Did I, did I get it? Did I respond in a way that's satisfactory? It's not satisfactory. <laughs> so in the sense that, uh, like, um, if you are saying you have a diverse audience, especially in your course, for instance, uh, that's coming from different fields, they're not statistics experts, yeah? Um, they're not, you know, having continuous scientific discussion about which statistical method is the appropriate one. They'll have problems having very basic addressing of very basic issues, and they're not taught in this, in this issue. 
And so, and I think this is the key issue about this. And I mean, this is why, for instance, we are addressing this with, you know, getting uh, more physicists, for instance, educated with these statistical methods, which in the physics curriculum has also been very small um, to, to kind of address these things. Um, so, well, so, sorry. Well, I think then it is actually on those uh, physicists to bring more of these perspectives into the courses that they're running and teaching. And uh, we don't assume uh, or propose that the kinds of uh, perspectives that we have and the research and scholarship that's happening in the humanities and social sciences on AI and ML is going to you know, be the one sort of driver and move of change. I actually think that there's lots of different kinds of stakeholders who need to be part of it. And maybe there will, be, I actually think things have started to change. And I think this is why, uh, whether it's investigative journalism, whether it's public education through different fora, uh, whether it's courses like ours, uh, you know, that there, there are courses that happen very much downstream at the undergraduate level, and there are things that happen upstream. Um, I think all of these are actually necessary to bring about the kinds of transformation in curricula. And there are other, I mean, I think it's a very good question to uh, do these kinds of audits of courses happening in different universities. I know that, for instance, in com between computer science and Cambridge Digital Humanities, I think there's a new module going to be taught next year called uh, about critical technical practice uh, with a professor of computer science design and um, design and uh, from people in the, the humanities and social sciences. So I think that things are happening in small ways. We don't have a have blueprint, yes, for what works. They happen in other places also in a big way. So I just mentioned broadening the perspective as well. For instance, uh, in Munich, we are running a program which is called AI is a minor, um, which basically goes across all of uh, all of the university. So this includes in particular the humanities as well, to teach them about AI and to make sure you know that we can have these conversations that we can have appropriate tools. And what the key element of this story is is that we teach the basics about statistics and computer science that are necessary to have a meaningful conversation about this rather but than... I think also sorry uh, I thought you'd finished uh, but I think also there's there might be an understanding an enhanced broadened understanding of things like statistics as also social uh, sociological rather because it's not just about the architecture of that model. It's also about like, what are the terms and conditions under which people negotiate data and where it comes from? What are the regulatory frameworks around that? What is, what is the pipeline between the architecture of a model and training of people in an institution and then its deployment in industry? You know, these are all these, it, it's, I, I think there's a, you know, focusing on technical expertise is one part of it, but the system is actually a little bit larger. So maybe there's space for different kinds of experts is, you know, just the, the point I would make. So I think the, the conversation that's happening across different um, cohorts, uh, you know, communities, as you're pointing out in your university is, is absolutely essential. It's another thing that I think the work of bringing people on board and saying, um, I'll be really honest, um, you know, there's people like me who don't have a technical background uh, are invited to speak in places, but our expertise has to also be taken seriously. Uh, it's one part of the much larger sort of process that's ongoing here. Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, the kinds of things I do is sort of uh, understands and is going to reshape the models that uh, that exist. That's work that other colleagues will do in their own fields. But I think that uh, the for regu if you think about who's actually in implementing regulation, they're not computer science experts. A regulator, uh, the public need to have different kinds of accountability over these models. People are not going to become computer scientists. So there's different ways in which I think um, members of the public and public institutions also need to be part of this conversation to make it um, more kind of holistically uh, accountable, I think. I don't know if there were other questions. I didn't want this to get into like a back and forth uh, between us, but thank you very much. That's a really great, um, very good uh, sort of like prompt and question. And, you know, definitely leaves me thinking as well about how much more we could do to um, kind of situate ourselves in this. Uh, I've just got another question. It possibly looks at uh, the overlap between technical and other areas. And that's 
when you're a technical person, you make various pragmatic decisions in, in implementing models. And the one that's most obvious is in the way we design loss functions. But we very rarely consider the philosophical implications of those loss functions. And I don't very often see where that's implemented in the the loss function is basically implying that you have an utilitarian philosophy. But we, we sort of threw that out years ago, but actually it's being allowed into our social systems. I don't know where it's discussed. If you've come across that elsewhere, that would be really helpful. Well, actually, um, you know, the, the course that we run, I'll start with talking about that. Uh, the second module is about the ethical and social challenges in AI and my colleague, um, Dr. Henry Shevlin is a philosopher and he leads that module. And there's a very deep conversation there about these different kinds of traditions from philosophy. And uh, we get the cohort to become quite familiar with the, you know, whether it's the deontological and the virtue and the utilitarian approaches. And I, so I think that discussion is actually quite robust across a, a different courses that we've seen uh, happening on this topic. I think there is definitely a significant rise of this kind of thinking. Um, I think you're absolutely right that this kind of inquiry doesn't quite happen, but I, you know, in, in the context of, the, the the technical development. However, I think it is the one area that does get a lot of traction. You do see a number of courses that are at the intersection of law, computing, and philosophy. And you know, there's people like Seth Lazar at um, Australia National University. I think there's some folks at Harvard. A number of um, and there are quite a few others actually who are sort of working in this space. Now, my question is or rather my concern often is that it's one thing to, to understand what the trade-offs are and, are and how they're being made. It's another thing to say, well, we're just going to go with this because if I wanted to actually implement any kind of change and follow that philosophical path, then I'll realize that it expands beyond the framing of a specific problem we're trying to solve. And I think this is why approaches like utilitarianism are quite helpful because they allow you to become very specific about what trade-offs you're making and what the challenges could be on either side. Now, the purpose of that should be to say, there are negative externalities from taking this path. How do we control and contain for that? But I don't think that always happens. So um, I can leave you with uh, some more uh, resources, I think, because I think this is something that gets a lot of traction. But my point is that I think, as in like philosophy and computing, but I don't think it goes beyond that in terms of if you do face some kind of hard choice, then how are you managing for that? How are you uh, taking responsibility for that? I think, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Any further questions? Um, I had a follow-up question to something that Sven was asking about, actually. So, in the real world, what does someone like Dr. Sweeney actually do when she detects this problem with Google Ads? Is there, is there an initiative to basically get a forum where she can go in and say, hey, I'm getting these interesting kind of ads, and I think this is a problem, and then you can bring it to, and then you can study this? Is there an initiative like, like this? In fact, I think a lot of changes have happened because academics have identified problems. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, rather than, uh, I, I'm not sure in the case of Professor Sweeney exactly how that changed things. Um, and that's something I'm sure that the, the paper, if you look at her page um, at, uh, I think she's at the Harvard Kennedy Center, if I'm not mistaken now, uh, it's probably there what the follow-up was. In her case, she actually worked in government and governance. So uh, interestingly, the responses, I think that she might have did not happen, may not have happened in that moment, but came in later and maybe her decision to work as a technologist in government could have been part of that. But I think the more successful and interesting and compelling um, example comes from uh, Dr. Safia Noble's uh, Algorithms of Oppression, which you might have heard about. And Safia Noble is an information scientist who um, and an academic who wrote this book. I mean, it's now quite famous that, you know, when she kind of searched for things like professional hair or black girls, you know, in the context of professional hair, it was always white women's hair. In the context of black girls, there was a lot of pornographic and sexualized imagery which came up. Now, that actually changed, has changed quite radically. 
uh, because of that book and because of her research. So it's interesting that now if you search for black girls and professional hair, what you will find in Google is actually references to Safia Noble's book. And I think that, you know, uh, there are uh, if you look at Google's uh, blogs also, I mean, like the work done by computer scientists to identify uh, embedding of gender bias in translation, they fixed those things, you know, so there is a pipeline where I think there's also an understanding that uh, scholars and researchers, uh, there's a strong association between industry and academia anyway, and I think academics are often finding things that can then be fed back to industry, so those partnerships are relevant and necessary um and and i think they can be quite productive um as i've i've tried to show i hope that answers your question sorry so i was uh, sorry i was not clear i think uh what i was trying to ask was uh when was suggesting is there a place for example in cambridge like if someone, ah. same problem is there a place where you can actually go to a person who understands statistics and who understands how algorithms work and say hey i suspect this is happening could you actually help me out uh, I don't know. I'm quite new in Cambridge. I haven't been here that long, so I wouldn't know uh, how that happens. But I think that if I, uh, you know, people that I know who don't have backgrounds in um, in data science and computer science were to find something, I think, I mean, there are people individually that we know. I mean, uh, even if you look at, um, you know, Professor Neil Lawrence's AI at CAM initiative and, um uh, I mean, these are the kinds of people, and you know, uh, Professor Lawrence has been working quite extensively in this in this field. You know, these are the kinds of people that I would go to 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 talk about that, and uh, and I'm pretty sure this is happening anyway uh, across the university. Um, who do I know? Well, I mean, even at the Leverholm Center, uh, there's some of my colleagues who may be working across psychology, cognitive science, philosophy, and um, computer science uh, would be, I think it's in some of those clusters or, uh, around particular kinds of uh, research questions where you have these interdisciplinary clusters where uh, discussions are probably happening. And, you know, if each of those clusters is constituted by people from different fields, um, then you have many more networks to different parts of the university where you could potentially take some of these concerns. And I think uh, with what's happening with large language models now, I know that some of these researchers are kind of super users and testers and kind of identifying uh, challenges and as well as opportunities within them. But I'm not so sure on the bias side, you know, or the discrimination side. I mean, the networks that exist would uh, be a first port of call and then people would, would take it from there and advise, I suppose. Okay, any further questions? Okay, if not, let's thank our speaker again.